Wait a minute. You're saying my son used the Spear of Destiny to stab some person? He no person. He was Nazi. Hey, keep digging, guys. We're almost there. You know why I so good at digging, Henry? It from when I part of slave mine in India caverns. Junior, is there any truth to the fantastic story Mr. Round is telling? I don't know, Dad. I was under a voodoo spell during a lot of that. A what? This isn't archaeology. It's barely piracy. Dad, maybe a little less complaining and a little more digging. Oh, Dr. Jones? Yes? Look what I find. Oh, I don't believe it, Shorty. It's another lost podcast episode. Be careful with that, Junior. Some things are better off lost. Yes, even I'm using the word chitter chat. I'm using. <laughs> I have become Lloyd, what I most despise. Bar and you! Bar and you! That guess my goat be true! Okay, so I we, thought. Did we, we didn't do an intro. Do you want to do an intro real quick? Let's do an intro real quick. Hi, everybody. Welcome to That Gets My Goat. On the go. On the go. This is Big Yankovic. And this is the late Rish Outfield. And uh, it's we not are. that late. I still got time. <laughs> Temperature has gone down three degrees since you. Four degrees since you put the windows up. How is oh. that possible? I suppose it's just. Back here, getting into the canyon part here, instead of more out in the open? I don't know. Big and I are on our road trip, the last road trip, capital trademark, uh, by James Patterson in bookstores in December. I mean, it wasn't really written by James Patterson. It was written by another guy, but James Patterson's name is on it so that you will buy it. Um, Have we ever talked about whether you would do that? Oh, whether I would write a book with James Patterson or whether I would take credit for someone else's work. Oh, well, that's... Like James Patterson. Yeah, before we get to our list, let's, let's talk Lend about that. Lend them the awesomeness of my name. Okay, well, the... <laughs> that's a two-part question. Let's do the you now, with your career as it stands, hooking your wagon to the James Patterson train, doing one of those, what did they call them? A book short or some shit like that? I'd probably do it. I mean, why wouldn't you? Book I shot. I don't get paid uh, to write right now, so getting paid to write would be neat. Doesn't get any greener, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Should we get out and take a picture of the sign? Yeah, we'll do it quick. All right. We that just one. got a picture of the arches sign. That was funny because as soon as we got there to take the picture... Um, new people came up. Like, we had come up with the idea of taking a picture in front of that, and they're just like, oh, 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 stop, honey. Honey, look what they're doing. Let's do that. And so uh, we had somebody take a picture for us, if we would take one for them. And then while we were taking their picture, a new group of people came and said, would you take a picture for us, of us? We Obviously, they were from Canada. Thank you very much for taking a picture in your fine country, he said. And Yes, uh, that's a Manitoba accent, I think. Yeah, I and think so. uh, we took a picture of the Indian family, and you know, it's just like, oh, oh, before you go, sir, before you go, oh, yeah, kind of thing. So I, it was supposed to be. I said, oh, we'll just leave the thing rolling and go take the picture, and you know, we'll be back in like thirty 15, seconds. Thirty seconds, and we'll be good. But no, it turned into a much longer pause in the recording, unfortunately. But oh well, you'll just have to scroll a little further down the uh, file, edit it out, I guess. When I see something like this, where they've got a Hawaii license plate, part of me thinks, what the hell? (laughs) Because one of two things are possible. One, it's a lie. They're not from Hawaii. (laughs) There is no Hawaii. (laughs) And the other is they paid to have their car shipped over from the Hawaiian Islands to the continental United States, and they're driving around. Can you think of, can you possibly think of a third option? They rented one that just... Uh, no, there's no other option. In the, the amount of money that it would take for somebody on a boat to 
ferry over your car so that you could drive it around in America. I, I know you're in America, but you know what I mean. In in no grass skirt allowed America, <laughs> I think you could rent a, a very nice car. Well, I assume that they've moved here, you know. You, oh, you have... That's, the, that's a f- oh, is that... I see, I didn't realize that was different than your second option. But I assume, yeah, they've moved here from the islands. They're not going back. And so they, they had their car. And it, it was at least cheaper than buying a new one. Just a tiny bit. <laughs> God damn it. You, take yours all the way down. You, that should be fine. Yeah, I just put mine up because all the cars are driving past as we go. Plus, the cars out there on the, the big road are also going past, and like a giant truck went Rah! right past us. So, so this is a that gets my goat on the go in name only. Because <laughs> if you had to, you can even translate it to kilometers if you want to. If you had to guess how fast we were going in kilometers, what would you say? In kilometers, I would say one kilometer. Which uh, is a little more in miles, I think. Oh, no, a little less. So Zero. It's less, yeah. Zero miles per hour. Okay. Yeah, we're stopped. But that's fine, guys, because it means more podcasting joy for you. Yeah, we're uh, trying to get into the National Park, but the line is just going back quite a ways. So, yeah, we'll see how this goes. I hope my, I I got an annual pass for the national parks and I'm hoping that it still works because I'm pretty sure it was this same week last year that I got it. So I don't know if it still works or if I'm going to have to buy a new annual pass, which I'm going to go ahead and do because it'll be worth it, but it's a lot. Anyways, we have something we're going to do in this? We were talking about something before and I can't remember what it is now, Uh, but it's gone now, whatever it was, whatever story it was, it's over. It'll have to be an outtake. I wanted to, to do this list here. Okay. A list? It's a list show. We haven't done a list show in a long time. Well, it's, it's This not... is 25... No, it's got to be a really odd number nowadays. 29 things that will make you LOL and OMG. I can't believe what 23 says. Oh, gosh. That... that oh. We could do a whole episode about the <laughs> clickbait bullcrap. I, I wish that I had a sharp enough wit to skewer those bastards. Where it's just like, you'll never guess what the cash from... Just a second, let me come up with something super, super recent. You'll never guess what the cast of Fuller House looks like today. And yeah, you're supposed to click on it. Oh, and one thing that is just infuriating is that they'll have a picture, they'll have a photo. And just yesterday I saw one where it's like, what does the cast of Jurassic Park look like today? And they had Why was an it your grandma? image of... Because they're bastards. <laughs> oh, okay. Because... So your grandma's a bastard. I see. And they had a picture of Laura Dern on the left, and then the decomposing corpse of Jessica Tandy on the right. And I was like, dude, this isn't even the same person. You pieces of crap. Clickbait. I'm never... No. I need to find out what this you website know. is and block it on my computer. And hack it. Bring it down! No, yeah, the ones that I hate much worse than something like that is where they say, you'll never believe what the 15 child stars from the 80s look like now. And they have a picture of some child star. And then you go to it and you're like, oh, I'm interested in what that person looks like. And that's not one of the stars in the article! They talk about 15 completely different stars. Oh my gosh, do I yeah, hate that? I see that from time to time. And I'm sure if I clicked on the Jurassic Park one, that image would not have been there because we know what Laura Dern looks like today. She's still acting. She's in Star Wars Episode Eight for for Bosk's sake. <laughs> and to have a 90-year-old stranger in the same image is just, it's dishonest. And they don't care because they got their ad revenue. There's another thing that I complain about all the time. You have to hear it from me every single third day is, you know, I go to a YouTube video and the ad loads fine. It plays the ad and then the video doesn't play. And I'd be like, oh, but the ad revenue came in, didn't it? Even though I didn't get to see the content. You had to sit through all 30 seconds of the full ad to be able to go to the... And then it doesn't even play the video, which was only going to be 29 seconds long anyway. 
just sits there and spins and spins and spins. Loading, loading. Okay, not really loading. I don't know. For some reason, the ad revenue thing really, really bothers me. And I, I've started uploading things on YouTube, but not a lot because I, it's still alien to me. But like we, you and I have done several sketches or, you know, I write sketches for my own show and stuff. And I thought, well, if I put those on YouTube, maybe six people will look at them, which I think is the record for my <laughs> videos on there. And, you know, there are options that you can have ad revenue. And if it's something that I've made up, you know, I worked on it, I wrote it or whatever, then there's nothing stopping me from getting ad revenue for it. But I've never bitten Partly because, you know, everything new is scary to me. Any, any new technology, any new... Anything that deviates from the miserable life that I already have. But uh, we wrote a... If we did a song on the Dune Steve, and I had the option of putting a commercial at the beginning of it and making a quarter of a cent per click, or... I, I mean, I have no idea. No, that's... If you're somebody like... Uh, you know, nine million subscribers. Ah. Then you get a quarter of a cent per click. Someone like you gets a one millionth of a cent per click. Yikes! Anyhow, that's not what I wanted to talk about today. Oh yes, it was the a list show. The, so uh, this is top forty books that shaped America. Okay. So this is sort of a two-part thing. I wished I could com- I could find the combined list. But I wasted a half hour yesterday just trying to find this. Uh, this was an article that I clicked on months and months ago, and I said if we ever go on a road trip, I will print this out and we'll see how it goes. But the Library of Congress did an online poll. They asked experts to give their most influential American books. And then, after they published that list... They asked their readers, their... What do you call it? Subscribers? Well, yeah, just just, just normal people. They asked the masses Mm -hmm. to give... So it was 65 most influential American books, but the first 25 had been supplied by the experts. And it included more traditional choices, such as Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, Mark Twain... Should I not be reading this part? I don't know. Because I, I don't know your plan. I wanted you to try and guess what was on the list. No. But. I would probably but, do a crappy job. So okay, so well. If that's really what you wanted, then this show would I just have to be thrown out. Well, that's what this show is. So <laughs> Oh, crap. Zero subscribers, <laughs> zero ad revenue, apparently. Okay, uh, traditional choices such as Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Joseph Heller's Catch-22, and here's the odd one, although I guess Cat in the Hat is kind of odd from those others, Benjamin Spock's Baby and child care. Huh. So those are the ones that the experts chose. And then what follows is 40 books that shaped America from the online poll of help, readers, subscribers. Subscri- uh, yeah, people that took the Library of Congress's online poll. Anyway, so we've got 40 books here. And my choices were to ask you to guess what some of them were and I'd be like, yep, oh, that's on here. Nope, that's not on here. Or we can just go down the list, which... uh, Talk about whether we agree or something like that? uh, Well, I I don't know. I just... We had done the thing where you were stuck in traffic, and I asked... I did one of those guess kind of things, and I thought Uh it was fun. So I felt like this would be the same thing, but... uh, It's a little bit more difficult than guessing a a song from its first word. Yeah. Because, yeah, like a lot of those, like... Are the writers American or not? I don't know, you know? Am I am I getting an American book or not? I can obviously not pick uh, J.K. Rowling. And see, that's the strange thing, is when you're dealing with the masses, when you're dealing with just everybody, 
it's all personal opinion. It's no yeah. longer the expert saying, oh, well, you know, this this book really, you know, changed. When the uh, Grapes of Wrath was released, you know, it had this huge impact on people. So my guess is when normal folks were voting or submitting names, that you got a lot of Harry Potters and stuff like that. Right. Things that just, they had to toss out because they like, no, that's not American. And so that's part of why this list was interesting to me is because there's things where you're just like, how did that end up on the list? Okay. Now, uh, the preferable thing for me would have been if I could have found the, the 25 list from the experts and combined it with this viewer poll so that we had 65 books. And that way I'd be like, okay, well, guess. And you would say, Catcher in the Rye. And I could say, oh yeah, that's number four. That kind of thing. But I couldn't find it even on the uh, Library of Congress's website. I couldn't find the list, the vetted list, the expert list. And so... Oh, so we've just got a combina the combination list only? No, so all we have is the oh, viewer just mail. Just the masses list. The masses list. For, but for example, uh, you know, Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is on that short list. But Tom Sawyer is not on the user list. And there's no way that could be absent. And so it must have been in the 25 list. You know what I'm saying? And so that bothers me because if I had just the full list, then I could be like, oh, yeah, Tom Sawyer right here. And, you know, it's like, oh, Satanic Verses by Solomon Rushdie. Nope, not on here. Rushdie is not American. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, uh, yeah, it's just that kind of thing. Anyway, we've hamstrung our own podcast. The Library of Congress ham hamstrung me. Damn that government institution. But I I'm still thinking that this might be fun to do. So if you'll give, like, five guesses, we'll do that, and then we'll just go down the list. Okay. The, the, what is it exactly? Books that shaped American culture? Top 40 books that shaped America, yeah. Um, okay. How about The Scarlet Letter? By? Uh, shoot. His name is... Yeah. It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't come to it. I want to say it's something with a U. Nathaniel Hoffman. There we go. That's totally not something with a U, but you got it. It's not on this list, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was on the uh, other list. It makes me want to just no. tear this up and say, <laughs> and just quit. Uh, next time we go on a road trip. <laughs> so the list that the experts made was not available. I couldn't not find available. it. not available. And all of the things that were on the list that the experts made are not included on this list. No, apparently what they did is they pulled their, they went on their website and said, this is what the, this is the top 25 that the experts picked. What would you pick that's not on this list? And so, so they, they compiled 40 after that. that. Yeah. So this is the... That's why I said things it, that shaped American culture numbers twenty six through sixty five. There you go. Wow. So my if my guess is too good, it's not going to be on there <laughs> because it's going to be up in the top twenty five. Okay, well let me. Well, it makes life difficult. Let me try things that are a little less. Because some of these you're never going to get. Some of these I would never get after reading the list. Okay, how about uh, Lord of the Flies? It's William Golding. Not on this list, but... The Princess Bride. By William Goldman. Not on this list. Um, uh, I'm thinking I just need to put it away. Uh, whatchamacallit, uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged. Is, is that Ayn Rand? Uh, she is American, right? I don't yeah. know. Um, dude, it's not on the list, so <laughs> we should... Here, here, listen, kids. Well, why don't you read me what is on the list and let's discuss it. Instead of completely shredding it, read me what it says instead of me trying to guess it. Because that seems like uh, a bad idea. Well, it just, An idea it's, that's not going to work out for us. It sucks because if we went, if it was the complete list, the 65 list, and we went on it backwards... 
you'd start to get ideas of, oh, what's going to be up. And if we hadn't gotten to them yet, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, Atlas Shrugs is coming. Oh, it's definitely coming. Oh, and, you know, Lord of the Flies is coming because it hasn't been mentioned yet. And you'd be able to guess, and it would make for something interesting. Uh, but because it's an incomplete list, yeah, of course that should be on the list. I mean, absolutely Atlas Shrugs should be on the list. It's more influential than, well, according to the experts, all of these. Um, <laughs> Dr. Spock. Yeah, Dr. Spock's... Wait, no, Dr. Spock was on the expert list. It sure was. So, um, I'm just going to give you the the author. No, even that's not going to... Because, okay, number 40 is Robert Persig. Oh, who's that? He's the author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Okay. 1974. I have heard of that. Is that that old? And that is... I didn't realize that. That is number 40. So it's a lot of personal preference, a lot of people's, oh gosh, that book changed my life. Right. I don't know. Number 39, Robert Penn Warren, All the King's Men, 1946. That is about, what's his face, that guy in like Louisiana or whatever, Huey Long? Is it about Huey Long? Okay. Isn't that what that one's about? Thought so. Okay, 38, John Kennedy Tool. John Kennedy, the tool. Well, okay, John Tool, let's say. <laughs> a Confederacy of Dunces. 1980. I don't, I don't know if I'm familiar with that one. Do that you know what one that is? seems like a book from many, many years ago, not from 80, but I guess 80 is starting to be many, many years ago. <laughs> I guess so. Is it, what is that? Can you, are you, can you uh, tell me about it a little or no? You don't really know either. No, it's just, you know, I've heard of it. Okay. Okay, number 37, Napoleon Hill. Oh, that's the author. <laughs> I was thinking that was the name of the book, and I'm just like, I don't know that one. Napoleon Hill? Hmm. No? Okay. Is Hill called Napoleon? No, what uh, is that book? Think and Grow Rich, 1937. Really? You've never read... I'm, is you? that... No, is that just a self-help book? It is. It's one of those, every single person that's ever been involved in a pyramid scheme (laughs) has been given that book. Interesting. It's still, in 1937, someone wrote something about money that is still persisting. Seems kind of amazing to me. It's not on this list. so much. Yeah. I I thought of another book that's not on this list that had to have been on the, uh, the grown-up list. (laughs) Uh Walden. By uh, Henry David yes. Thoreau, right? Unless, is it possible that Henry David Thoreau was not American? Uh, I wouldn't think so, because Walden was in New York. Anyhow, I... Um, you know, when I was a kid... Okay. I went to the bookstore that was known as Walden. I don't know if you remember Walden Books. Sure, Walden Books. But uh, used to find it in malls relatively often, when malls still existed. But, uh, yeah, I went in there and I was getting something, and... I don't know why I would have had a check because I was a kid. I was very, I was young. But anyways, yeah, for some, I may have been writing the name of the place on the check. Oh, that seems wrong. But anyways, the guy says it's Walden, like the pond. And I said, uh, what? And the guy was disgusted that I didn't know what Walden was. Of course, I was like twelve. So, of course, I didn't know what Walden was. Well, maybe it wasn't Henry David Thoreau that wrote it, because I don't know what Walden is either. (laughs) Uh, Number 36 is Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nature, 1836. Okay. Oh, one that's not on here, that should be on the grown-up list? What's the Charles Darwin book? The Origin of Species? The Origin of... Yeah, you do realize that Charles Darwin is not American, at least? <laughs> I'm just hoping that that was a joke. <laughs> uh, it made me laugh, so it was a good one. Good job. Number 35... Petrified Dunes. No! Uh, Milton and Rose Friedman. Free to choose. Man, I don't... Is this another, I'm assuming, self-help type book? I, I gotta wonder. I, I, or, I don't know what it is. So these are books that have influenced people. These are books that have 
changed people's lives. It have forged right. the American landscape. Well, tons of. I mean, when when you look at publishing, like the the things that people re- really remember are fiction novels that uh, that did something for them. But the majority I've heard of publishing is actually nonfiction and self-help type stuff. Any old Joe who has a yoga studio and, you know, knows some platitudes that he can throw into a book or has lost some weight and did a YouTube series about it can make a book and, yeah, they're all for it and it sells tons. But, you know, the really hard stuff like to write a book with tons of, you know, interesting characters and great plot twists and etc etc yeah that those don't sell nearly as much from what I've heard anyway so I guess I shouldn't be that surprised that there's tons of things like that in here but man not really my thing I have read a few of those kind of things though so I can't complain too much okay next up uh, one you've actually read look what the that's an arch. I don't see anything. What up there? Oh, it's a hole. I don't okay. know what arch that is or if it even has a name, but there's a hole way up at the top of the cliff. It has a name. They all have a name. That's not an arch you can go and see, though. You can't just go get inside of it like some of the other ones. Uh, so next up, Shell Silverstein. Which one? Where the sidewalk ends? Or Light in the Attic? Neither of those were books. Those are collections of short stuff. Oh, okay. Although, you know, maybe that counts. I don't know. I, uh, okay, well, I mean... Does a collection of short stories count? I don't know. Because I, I just realized there's no Ray Bradbury on here. Oh, right. Yeah, and I wonder, course. would something he wrote have made the grown-up list? Or uh, do they are they disqualified? Because most of Bradbury's famous works, you know, Dandelion Wine... Illustrated Man, you know, that kind of stuff, are Martian collections. Chronicles. Martian Chronicles, yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I would think that that would count, but I don't know. I guess then, therefore, it must be uh, The Giving Tree. It is The Giving Tree. You've gotten one. Good job. 1964. All right, no, 32, Kate Chopin, or Chopin. Uh, shoot. Does that name mean something to you? It sounds, I think it does, but I couldn't tell you what it is, unfortunately. But well, feel free at home to uh, call out your answers, guys. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, you're doing better than I am, I'm sure you are. The Awakening, 1899. Why do I... It still it sounds familiar, but I don't know why. I don't know. I bet I, I must have had some contact with it in one of my literature classes over the years growing up. Okay. I mean, well, most of these books are not old books, are not ancient books. Uh-huh. Um, so it's just, uh, again, people, the, the masses voting for what they like from their childhood or from yesterday. Uh, so we got another Milton Friedman here. Capitalism and Freedom. 1962. Okay. Is that... Well, it's not the Communist Manifesto, so I don't know. But yeah, anytime you use the word capitalism, you know. Okay, so the next one, Simone Beck, Louisette Berthold, and Julia Child. Mastering the Art of French Cooking. A a cooking book. So Uh, this shaped American culture, just cooking? seems... Well, I guess we could talk about it. I mean, it's like, how does the giving tree shape America? I don't know. It's funny because when I was a kid, everybody talked about that book like it was a good book. Like it was a treatise on the love of a parent and just how a parent will give everything for their child because they love their child and how beautiful it is and all that. And now instead... It's looked at with revulsion by everybody I know. Like, what a piece of shit that child was. Just took everything from that person. Oh, right. And who cares how much they liked it? They just took and took. 
And I never want to have children because they're little monsters. And all they do is ruin your life. Or okay. whatever. I Absolutely don't... true. Every word you've said. But how has your opinion of the Giving Tree changed now that you're the parent rather than the kid? Because I'm assuming you read it as a child like I did. Yeah, I have read it as a child and have read it as an adult. And I, I don't know, I get the same thing out of it. I don't see it as just some monstrous, ah, uh, children are terrible and I just needed to read this to have an excuse to not have them. But I have four children and I love them all and I think, you know, that they are all wonderful and I would, you know, I've sacrificed a ton for them already and will continue to sacrifice for them. And I know that there will come a day that they'll, they're going to move on. You know, they're not going to be my kids. They're, I mean, they're going to be my kids, but they're not. You know, they're going to have their own life. They're probably going to have their own children, and they're not going to have time to devote to me. Uh, they may come and visit sometimes, but they're, they're going to move on. That's just the way it goes. And so you sacrifice a ton for these people that you love, and eventually, you know, you love someone, set them free. You know, you have to let them go on and do their own life. Just as your parents let you go on and have your own life. And, uh, I don't know. I, I still think that it's worthwhile. And I think having a, a child gives your life a lot of purpose. And, you know, can't have your own children. I think a lot of people find joy even in, you know, fostering and helping other people. What is that up there? Look at that. Which it looks, there's like a, well, right over in the shadow, it looks like a freaking, like a castle or something. It's interesting. Maybe you need to pull over and let me drive, because uh, I see no castles. <laughs> it's, it's just right in the shadow, straight ahead. There's like a bunch of little things up at the top, and then it kind of goes down. And there's like a pit, and then there's a thing sticking up out of it. I don't know, it just looks weird. Anyways, yeah, I mean, that's how I feel about it giving tree. I don't think of it as some, you know, portrait of a monster that eats its parent or something. Um, but yeah, what was the, I mean, the cookie one, I don't know, I guess, I don't know how that shapes culture per se, but maybe it does? Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. It's, it, I'm sure it sold millions of copies, and every parent who was a parent in 1961 had a copy of the book. Okay, so number 30 is Thomas Pinchon. P Thomas Pinchon? You Thomas are. Pinch one. Pinch. Gravity's Rainbow, oh. 1973. Now, that's one I've not heard of. Any idea? I'm not familiar with that one. It made me think of another one that should be on there and probably isn't, but what about Jonathan Livingston Siegel? Is that one on there? Or By is that something not a, Bach? What's his name? Is that not an American? I don't know. Okay, so number 29 is probably the last one we'll get to in this part of this, the episode. But this one you know. And this is one where I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I can see why this would be on the list. Frank Herbert. Dune. Dune. No, wait, it's probably Dune Messiah. It's... Uh, wait, why? <laughs> it's one of the... <laughs> so it's, it's... Less than awesome sequel. Kevin Anderson... Right, that's and the Brian one. Herbert's Mentats of Dune. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Dune is great. I actually saw, I was at the library the other day, and they had the audiobook of it, and I thought, oh, should I get this? I mean, I'm in the middle of an audiobook right now that's, uh, and there's a fat dude with a shirt over his face. Uh-oh, if he's fat, what are we? Ooh, 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 ooh. ooh parking spot. We win. All right. Well, we're going to go on our hike, and I'm sure you will be able to feel the tiredness in our bones. Yeah, you'll be able to smell the sweat when we come back through the speakers. Tiguan. I think my neighbor has a kid named Tegan. Ah, oh, no. Really? Yep. There's Keegan Michael Key, too. Tegan is... Uh, Girl's name, apparently. No! It's awful. Okay, baby, finish what you started. I'm incomplete! That ain't no way to treat the broken hearted. I need some 
Sympathy! So, yes, we just talked about Dune. 1965. Steve? Frank Herbert's <laughs> Dune. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Do you remember that time when we did the uh, definition of Dune Steve where you asked me, what is a Dune Steve? And I said, oh, well, you know, uh, before I was known as Big Inglevich, I used to just go by my birth name, which is Steve. And uh, I like Dune so much that I always had the book Dune in my backpack. And so when people would see me, they'd be like, hey, there goes Dune Steve. And so it just kind of became... Anyways, yes, Frank Herbert's Dune Steve. Clearly that book shaped your America. Yes, shaped culture. It's funny because I never read Dune. Until, how old was I? I was in my 20s when I first read Dune. I think I tried to read it once earlier, but I could not make heads or fucking tails of the thing. Because, uh, you know, it's not like it's a, a terribly hard read, but it's not an easy read. You sure it's not a terribly hard read? Well, it's, it's difficult. It takes some effort. I wouldn't recommend it to a teenager, because they're just going to hate it, but... Uh, you get a little older and you're gonna really enjoy it. Funny thing is, it didn't shape my culture at all. Yeah, Dune Steve actually has nothing to do with Dune, but, uh, you know, whatever. That's life. Yeah, I, I tried. I still haven't read it. I think you said you had it at your local library in audio. Yeah. I considered grabbing it. Of course, I'm in the middle of a of 10,000 Kingdoms by N.K. Jemison, and I don't want to, I, I don't know, getting a book, audiobook from my library is... Is it really 10,000 Kingdoms? 100,000 Kingdoms. Oh, because I was going to say, my story is 10,000 Coffins, and I thought, oh shoot. 100,000 Kingdoms, I think it's actually called. But yeah, getting something from my library is always dangerous, because I never, ever go there. They have placed the library in the middle of nowhere. And so the only reason you go to the library is because you're going to the library. You can't just swing by a few places and drop your books off at the library while you're out. It doesn't happen because there's nothing else there. And it's so dumb and I hate it. The end. All right. Okay, number 28. Madeleine Langle. Langle. Yes, I don't like Madeleine Langle's book. What is it called? Uh, Splinter in the Mind's Eye. What is it called? It's something weird like that. A Wrinkle, a wrinkle in, time. in Time. There we go. 1962. I also read that when I was an adult, not when I was a child. Turns out. I, well, I should change that. I listened to the audio of that because I'm like, oh yeah, that was a big deal book. And everybody talked about it when I was a kid, like it was something good. <laughs> like they, you know, like it, it's a kid's book. But I can't understand any child liking it. It's so not child friendly. It's philosophical and like dystopian and just not awesome. Like, not the kind of things that kids would be into, at least compared to now. You know, the YA stuff that they devour, nothing like a wrinkle of time. So I don't understand the appeal of it, how it became such a big deal. Did you read that in, like, school or anything growing up? I can't remember. It was a lifetime ago. I knew a wrinkle in time from somewhere, whether there was a animated adaptation of it or something. Or a made-for-television movie, or, Probably or we did read it in class. I just, but usually I would remember the books we read in class. I just don't remember yeah. it. But it is one of those books that Hollywood keeps talking about adapting. I guess they what they they need to do is figure out a way to make it like high school, <laughs> and then people will go see it. One thing that I know about that book is that a wrinkle in time saves nine. Chima. Okay, number 27, Wilson Rawls. Uh, hold on, I know this one. And this one, actually, I, I agree with. It's a good book. It's the one about the dogs. Yes. Uh, Where the Red Fern Grows. Excellent, 1961. Yeah, that's 61, one. 61, huh? Interesting. It feels like it's a book from longer ago. 
like the I, 30s or something. To me, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it is, I guess, because it's written about a bunch of hillbillies, basically, that it's totally foreign to our experience. Um, and we read it. I guess you know, it's written in 1961, but it probably is set in the 30s. Oh, okay. Because at the very start, there's a chapter where, like, a guy is somewhere and he sees somebody, like, being mean to dogs or something like that. And then it makes him remember his dog. And uh, then it takes him back and he tells the whole story. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had a copy of that. I don't know if I ever read it as a kid. We read it in class. Yeah, that's what it was. And and everybody loved it. To the point where my friend even went out and, like, rented the movie of it. Because, like, there was a, some raccoon that they were trying to catch that was just, like, the world's hardest raccoon to catch. And in the end, his dogs figured out what it was doing. They had some fancy trick that it did. And I remember my friend going and getting the movie and being like, Oh, yeah, this is how the raccoon gets away. Which turned out to not be the case because they uh, changed in it. the end they changed it for the movie, probably because there was no way to make it happen the way it happened in the in the book without a CG raccoon or something. But uh, everybody really got into that book and liked it a lot. And I think my daughter really loves it too. They've read it in her school, and I have the audio, an audio book of it. And yeah, I think she's listened to it. Probably at least twice. Oh, that's right. And who, who does the audiobook? Uh, oh, it was Ron Jeremy. Whoa. All right, so number 26. This one's difficult. Robert A. Heinlein. Okay. <laughs> um, Starship Troopers? No, which makes me wonder if it might have been on the 25 list, although probably not. Uh, have spacesuit will travel. No, but... Uh... Straight? No, that wasn't Heinlein. Hmm? Was it Heinlein? The one you that, don't like, Stranger in a Strange Land. I thought that was... No, it wasn't Dick. Uh, it would have been Heinlein. So Stranger in a Strange Land, is that it? No, not that one either? It's uh, weird that you are able to name all of these books of by him that... That do not appear. Sir, not appearing in this film. Yeah. Sir, okay. not appearing on this podcast. Uh, I don't know. What is it? It's The Moon is a Harsh oh, Mistress. The Moon is a Harsh 1966. Mistress. And I don't know why that one is on there and not something else. Not but. Starship Troopers, which they made a movie of. Interesting. Yeah. That was one. I remember back when I, right after I graduated college, I joined the Science Fiction Book Club, which was like a BMG Music Club kind of a thing, but for books that were science fiction. So you'd get like a little magazine every month and you could pick like a title out of it or you'd do nothing and they would send you their pre-chosen title. Uh, and you had to pay a certain amount, but you also got like, I don't know, six books free at the start or whatever. That's how I got a bunch of my, like, Robert Jordan books and stuff like that. But I was also going through and trying to get a bunch of, like, books from, like, sci-fi uh, luminaries. And, yeah, Moon is Our Mistress was one of the ones that was available. I didn't get it, but I did get Starship Troopers and Strangers, Stranger in a Strange Land, which, oh, man, I did not appreciate Stranger in a Strange Land. I didn't mind Starship Troopers at the time. I've heard a lot of people say they went back and read it, despised it then, when they were older, and etc. But didn't you read it and hate it? Very recently, yeah. About 2015, 2014. Uh, 25, you should get this one. James Fenimore Cooper. Uh, Last of the Mohicans? Yeah, 1826. Yeah. See, that one seems like it is a given that that one should be on every list. Yeah, that should have been on the pros list or whatever. Uh, uh, you used to always tell me the name of the main character, and it would make me laugh. Uh, I wish I could remember him now. I want to say I it was like Natty the... Bumpo or something. <laughs> that might be it. I remember the bad guy, and that one was Magua, at least in the movie. 
I loved that movie. It had Madeline Stowe in it and uh, Daniel Day Lewis. Daniel Day Lewis is Natty Bumpo or whatever his name was. <laughs> they changed his name in the movie adaptation, I think, right? Yeah, I don't know. Because the name was just too too comical. The movie of Last of the Mohicans was one of my favorites from my teenage years. I loved that movie. And loved, loved, loved the soundtrack to that movie. I remember uh, it had two names. Yeah. And you used to always tell me the backstory of how that worked. I've forgotten it now. But. Yeah, it was Trevor Jones, and I can't remember that. I want to say James now. Newton Howard was the second. I was going to say it's Adelman, Bridge Adelman. Oh, okay. Somebody, anyways, I think uh, for some reason they didn't like the Trevor Jones stuff, and so they hired Rich Edelman to fill in the stuff that he hadn't finished, or maybe he didn't make it, or whatever the deal was. But yeah, the, the other stuff is so uninspired and awful, but the Trevor Jones stuff is freaking amazing. And so the soundtrack version that I have of it, I just ditched a bunch of songs, deleted them. And uh, only kept the uh, the good stuff. But yeah, I just, I don't know, man. That movie was so powerful. It really moved to me when I was a teenager. And uh, a few years after the movie came out, we happened to be traveling in the southeast. And uh, we went to this place, and I want to say it was called Chimney Rock, which was where they filmed the movie. And, yeah, they had copies of the movie available for sale, like, in the gift shop. It was, like, a state park or something like that. And you could go up, like, they had an elevator in the middle of this rock, so you could go take it all the way up to the top. And, oh, man, it was a gorgeous place. It's in North Carolina, I believe, somewhere. So I had a big influence, or whatever you want to say, in my life, but not because of the book. You have read the book, though? No. That might be one to check out. I would read that. Oh, I mean, because it's 1826, it might be hard to... Yeah, it would be a hard read, I would assume. It would be like Watchmen Call It, you know, a, a Tom Sawyer or something. Or Scarlet Letter or whatever, where they use just archaic language. So you need almost like one of those uh, companions like you get with every Shakespeare thing so that you can understand what the frick this phrase means. Okay, next is Howard Zinn, A People's History of the United States, 1980. Okay. Okay, that I just don't get at all. I, I honestly, I don't get it because it's so recent. How could that have affected anything? And then also, it sounds like a textbook. Right. And how? why would people cite a textbook? I just, yeah, don't, I, I don't get it. Somebody might have to explain that one to I can only guess, me. yeah, that it's not what it sounds by its title. Okay. Number 23, Judy Bloom. Uh, Tales of Fourth Grade Nothing? No. Hey, God, it's me, Margaret. Are you there, God, it's me, Margaret? That's right. Are you there, God, it's me, Margaret? 1970. I don't remember if that's one that we read in class or not, but there was a lot to Judy Bloom that we read in class. Yeah, didn't Judy Bloom do like Tales of She did Tales of Fourth Grade Nothing? Yeah, super, super Fudge, fudge yeah. Uh, or was that somebody else? Well, Super Fudge was definitely her. Fourth Grade okay. Nothing was fourth probably her. Fourth Grade Nothing too. was the original book. Super Fudge was a sequel to Fourth Grade oh, Nothing. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I never read that one. I think that one was specifically for girls general and I, that might be why it's a big deal because it was a book just for girls and girls finally got somebody to make a book just for them okay um, i can see and that. it's also like all about a girl like hitting her oh. puberty and having her period and uh that kind of stuff too if i if i am not mistaken i can see why that's super influential big yeah. deal. why it shaped america Okay, so number 22, Larry McMurtry. I should know this, but I don't know what it is. What is it? Lonesome Dove. Uh, I love I've Lonesome Dove. Like the sailor who returns home from the war and his child is there waiting for him on the dock. That's how I love Lonesome Dove. One time, 
because we do those kind of stories at work all the time about the people who have shipped out and they've been gone for a year and then they come back and uh, their family is waiting there. Yeah, there's the child that's been born after they left and uh, there was one and I'm sure you're gonna love it. It's so cute. There's a girl sitting in a stroller. There's a little sign in front of her that said, I just met you and I know this seems crazy, but my name's Haley and I'm your baby. You've told me that before. I actually got a migraine from how hard I rolled my eyes. Um, yeah, I had to edit a couple of those stories. And, you know, it's like, okay, hey, make sure you get the hug. Make sure you get the reaction on the dude's face. Yeah, I love those stories, man. I mean, they make me freaking cry every time. It makes me want to ship out so that I can come back and actually get that much emotion out of somebody. Somebody actually loves me that much that they, like, come running and screaming and jump into my arms and just make out with you. And they don't even care that you're in the middle of everybody and, and you know some guy with a freaking tv news camera is zoomed in on your face they're just like i don't care man i'm gonna take my clothes off right here too whoa i missed this dude you make it sound pretty nice there yeah i, I there's a few things like that that you know almost makes me want to uh sign up because of that the other thing <laughs> this is totally dumb because i would not be able to really be a part of this but I would like to have a, a funeral <laughs> that they do for people like that, for a fireman or a policeman or, you know, a fallen soldier where it's just full of all this ceremony and, you know, the, the flag draped coffin and the bagpipes playing Amazing Grace and all the policemen, you know, freaking making the huge long procession. There's no way that my life is going to mean that much to anyone, unfortunately, so it's never going to happen. It's sad, yeah, when you came back from that business trip, and you'd been gone, what, 40 days? Okay, it might only have been 30 days, but nobody in your family wanted to go to the airport. It's like, but we haven't seen him, and like, ah, I'm not going. Well, if she's not going, then I don't have to go, so yeah, I, <laughs> that's hard. Um, yeah, I read Lonesome Dove when I was an extra, and we were in a holding, you know, the place where you wait where you spend most of your time as an extra. Anyway, I got to the end, and I was just crying and sniffling, and I was just like holding the book close to my heart. And this dude came up to me, a stranger, another extra, and he's like, what the hell are you reading, man? And I just said, oh, it's Lonesome Dove. I just, I, oh my gosh, I love it so much. And the guy says, well, I, I want to read it. How much do you want for it? And I was like, I mean, it's all tear-stained and... <laughs> the pages are stuck together with snot and, and he's like well here here's three bucks or something like that and I was like oh okay and anyway he sat down and I ended up working with this guy a lot of times and he would always do this with books but this is the first time I ever saw it but he would just read and after he read a page he would tear it out and they throw it away and he'd go to the next one and tear it out and that way he never had to figure out where he was but it bugged me so much that he was tearing out pages of the book that I loved them. <laughs> so he, he didn't like read it and then come back to you later and go, what the hell? That book sucked. It was like a cowboy book. What is wrong with you? It was a cowboy book. Yeah, I mean, but like these days, man, a cowboy book, people are going to meet you because they're like, oh, they're going to make the hand gesture that you couldn't see, but you know what I'm talking about. Masturbatory hand gesture. It'd be like, dude, this is what you crying over? I see, I'd be afraid, especially if you knew you were going to see that guy again. Did you know, or did you, like, at this point, he was a total stranger. He was a stranger, yeah. You did not notice that he was somebody you worked with more than once. Uh, so after that, after, yeah, he had talked to me, then I started to notice him. And that's the thing, is that there were people that were extras. That was their job. And so you'd end up working with the same people over right. and over again, same faces over and over again. I, would, I don't know why, but I would be afraid to give that guy the book and then have him later be like, that book sucked. You're, you're fucked hard. Wow, dude. But you're wrong, though. I mean, it was 1985 that it came out. So even when it came out, cowboys were a thing of the past. Cowboys were uh -huh. passe and all that. So it just... And maybe, yeah, it's not universal. Maybe it doesn't appeal to everybody. But well, I just... I don't know. I mean, I, I've never read it, but I would like to. I remember one time when I worked at a video store, 
and I watched <laughs> Grumpy Old Men 2, which I believe is actually called Grumpier. Grumpier Old Men. And I thought it was really funny. It was like the new, the, one of the newest releases at the time. So, you know, it was like the one we, you know, everybody was looking for. We were kind of pushing and all that. And so I'd watched it and I'd really enjoyed it. I thought it was super funny. So I put it on your recommends. I just put it like it was on playing on the TV there. My girlfriend came in and she was watching it and she knew it. Like I told her, oh, you're going to love this. And so I put it on for her to watch. And I don't know if she was laughing as much as she was just because she was being nice to me. But she was laughing a lot. So this person comes in looking around at the store looking for a movie to pick. And after a while, she finally comes over and she's like, what are you watching over here? Because you are laughing your ass off. And I want to, I need to get this movie, obviously. And <laughs> the funny thing was, immediately my girlfriend's just like, oh... I mean, it's, it's okay, it's, it's, it's alright, I mean, it's pretty good, it's not like, you know, <laughs> immediately, like, basically what I was saying that I would feel like if it comes and goes, what is this book that you love so much? I mean, oh, well, it's, it's not really that good, I don't, I, I mean, you know, I'm going to lower your expectations now in case you get it and then don't like it because I don't want you to hate me for giving this to you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just I loved it that much, and I, I, need I don't care. I got it for my dad for Father's Day that yeah. same year. I tracked down a hardcover copy, oh, nice. and that was back when I had no money, so I'm, I'm sure I paid like eleven dollars for it. Holy what? Anyhow, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I'll have to uh, check that one out if you loved it that much. You know, yeah, just... there's only one book on this whole list that I like more than Lonesome Dove, and, and it's very very close. Have you ever seen an audio version of it? Did you ever watch the movie of it? Or the yeah. miniseries, I suppose it was called? Not I watched the miniseries back when it aired in 88 or 89. And uh, uh, then I watched it again. Af I rented it after, after you the, read the book. The book and it's pretty faithful, but it's not... I mean, it's a cut-down it version, even as right. a six hours or eight hours, however long it is. Does it have uh, power? The thing that's neat about Lonesome Dove... I mean, I don't know that it's neat, but... It was tremendously successful when he put it out, and so immediately he decided, you know, the publisher wanted a sequel, and instead he wrote a prequel about these old cowboys when they were young and when they first met, and that was tremendously successful. So he wrote a sequel to the prequel, and yeah, it wasn't until years and years later that he actually wrote a sequel Finally got back to in the timeline. Lonesome Dove, because they're already old men at the start of Lonesome Dove. Right. And, you know, they don't all make it through the book. And so when it came time to do a sequel, it's like, well, who's left? Yeah, well, now I don't have as many characters to work with. Anyhow, uh, that was that. The, cool. next, the next one, John F. Kennedy, Profiles in Courage, 1956. Uh -huh. So it wasn't President Kennedy. Interesting. I've heard of that book. But not being old enough to be around when it came out, I don't understand whatsoever the effect that it had on people. I'm, I wonder if it had any effect before, before he was president and then died, or if it was after, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, I want to read Profiles of Courage. That might be it. That made people feel like they knew him and it's probably super inspirational. I don't know, though. I don't know how that works. Okay, so next, Stephen King. Okay. I'm going to say It, because I would say that as far as things go, that's maybe his most influential book. Unless he has two. Does he have more than one on He him? just has one. Okay, I'm going to say It. As he turns people away from clowns forever. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's not it. It's not it! Oh, crap! You should make a sequel to that. Where it's it, you know, using the ice cream sandwich name. Anyways, uh, okay. Uh, then I'm going to say Carrie. No. Uh, the Shining. <laughs> Sorry, dude, what's his most famous book? <laughs> It's not The Shining, it's Salem's Lot. It's not. 1978. Cujo. <laughs> what? I don't, how am I... It's not Cujo, because that's way later. 
Seven, it's not the is it the it's not the stand, right? It's the stand, yeah. That was seventy eight? Yeah. Oh I, I thought that came out later. Really? The stand, huh? It's interesting. I mean that's my personal uh, preferred number one Stephen King book. Me too. But I think it might have a lot to do with the fact that it was one of the first that I ever read. It was the first epic one of his that I read too. You know, where it had a billion pages in it. I think when I read it the first time, I was actually talking to my daughter about this the other day. I can't remember what version I read of it now. Because I think I started reading the more than a thousand, like the 1300 page version, where they restored a bunch of deleted pages, like 600 pages of deleted pages to it. But I don't think I finished it. And then I think later I had to go back and check it out from the library, and they had the original version, which was, you know, only like 800 pages. And so I don't know even what I actually read anymore, but I wanted to say, I was trying to tell my daughter about this the other day, saying, yeah, that was the first thousand-page book that I ever read, shortly followed up by Shogun. I don't know if I've read many other thousand-page books. I've read many that come close. But a thousand pages is a lot for a publisher to, to commit to printing. So I don't know how often that happens. But that's interesting. I don't know. I would think that it... Because, like, The Stand has never had a movie. The Shining had a huge movie. Although the movie, I would say, is more of a cultural touchstone than the book itself. Because the book is so... It's very different from the movie. Yeah, the movie is what everybody thinks of. You could say that uh, The Running Man had a big uh, result in American history because in the end, a hero flies a plane into a building. And then that happened somewhere else later that was kind of a big deal. I didn't read it until, you know, like 2008 or something like that. When I finally read it, I was like, holy crap. It's like, they could never make a movie that was faithful to this book ever again. A hundred years before they can do this. And of course they're not going to be doing The Running Man in 2117. You never know, maybe they will. I loved The Running Man. I really wish they had made a movie of it. <laughs> okay, number 19. Ernest? Ernest Goes to Camp. Hemingway. Uh, All's Quiet on the Western Front. Wait, was that Ernest Hemingway? No, it was Farewell to Arms was Ernest Hemingway. Wait, are you smelling someone's brakes like I'm smelling someone's brakes? Oh, is that what that is? I just thought it was you. I'm hoping it's not me, because that's not me. That's my car if it's me, you know what I'm saying? Bless you. Make sure we stop to get gas at the next place that there's a gas station, right? Okay. Down to a quarter tank, and I don't know, there's not a lot of towns out here. A lot of uh, high cliff walls and wide open, empty spaces. Okay, so this one is The Sun Also Rises. Oh, the Sun Also Rises. 1926. Okay. Not something that either of us have read. I haven't, yeah. I have to admit, I'm not great with classic literature. There's a few classic writers that I do enjoy. I do really like Dickens. Although that was an acquired taste, it took me a while to understand that. I was introduced to Dickens too young. And yeah, like other, like we were saying, maybe James Fenimore Cooper might be, you know, because it's old enough, there's a lot of things where you're just like, I don't understand what's going on. And so, yeah, I don't rush out and read the classic literature. As much. There was, there have been times where I thought, oh, I need to broaden my horizons. And so I'll read something or get the audiobook of it. Which, you know, if it's done by Frank Muller, you know, it's totally worth it. If it's not, then it's often not. I got an audiobook of Moby Dick. It was the worst experience of my life. I almost died listening to that book, just trying to stay awake. I remember driving home, being half awake, and there's a really weird moment in the book where it kind of changes 
from prose into an almost uh, like a play at one point, and that was going on in the audiobook as I was like struggling to stay awake, and I felt like it was in some kind of alternate reality or something. It's like uh, being in a, a, a weird dream sequence. It wasn't good. Yeah, sorry. That's a long story about how I haven't read much Hemingway. <laughs> It's all right. Number 18, Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter's unlucky. No? Well, that affected me, but... (laughs) I don't know. That shaped my America. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Oh, you did that? 1972. Yeah, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, I think I may have seen part of the movie and then just been like, what? I don't... I I don't... I don't get it. It didn't make it through. Yeah, and that's, I guess, have you seen the movie? No. Johnny Depp craziness? It was Terry Gilliam that directed it. Yeah, I know. I expected it to be good because I liked other Terry Gilliam things. And I loved, obviously, Monty Python. But yeah, I just didn't... I didn't get it. You know, there's some things where you need a lot of back story. A lot of uh, study needs to be done for you to really get them. And, you know, classic literature is the same thing. And I think do classes that include, you know, you read a Shakespeare play or something, and the only reason you understand those plays as opposed to the other ones is because you actually had enough education about it so that you understand what's being said and what's going on and stuff. Because otherwise, it's almost gibberish sometimes. And you've heard English speakers are the only people who aren't able to hear Shakespeare in their own language. Yeah, I've heard that. It makes, I mean, it's relatively true. And any time you go back far enough, you know, I, I think they do that even with, like, the Bible, where they take it and they retranslate it into uh, modern English so that it makes more sense instead of sticking with the old King James Version, which is, uh, you know, all set in archaic language and much more difficult to understand. There's something to be said about that archaic language. It seems to have more majesty and more force. I don't know, like, when they played that Johnny Cash song at the end of Logan, the man, when the man comes around. Yeah. And he's quoting all that stuff. And all the just, virgins are trimming their wings. Yeah. It's, it's hard for me to kick against All that the kind of stuff. There's just something to it that feels like more elevated or something. It's just like, oh, this this ancient language sounds so powerful, whereas if you said the same thing in more modern language, you'd be like, oh, well, I don't, yeah, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Or, yeah, obviously, that's like, that's the platitude that everybody has been saying for, you know, ever, or whatever, you know. Well, that's cultural in the same way that uh, when we hear someone speak with a British accent, we think, oh, right. this is ancient times. Oh, this is a long time ago because he has an English accent. And you're like, oh, it right. makes no sense. I mean, it's a, like a Roman Empire movie, but everybody speaks with British accents. You're just like, oh, yeah, of course they You do. just accept it. But if everybody <laughs> spoke with an American accent in a, a Roman Empire movie, you'd be like, what is this happy horse shit? <laughs> Even though, you know, it's... <laughs> Not it like makes, they had British accents. Yeah. When they spoke Latin. Okay, so number 17 is Ken Casey, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, 1962. Never read it. The movie's influential. I like the movie a lot, but... Yeah, I've heard a a lot about the movie, not about the book. Another uh, Jack Nicholson movie that seems to be a big deal. But... uh, you would like it. It uh, ends like a big Anglovich story. <laughs> uh, so number 16, another Ernest Hemingway. We've got a, a bigger deal Ernest Hemingway book. The only one I've ever read. Okay, you just have to give it to me. I can't guess it. The Old Man and the Sea. Oh, okay. 1952. I'd forgotten that that was a Ernest Hemingway. Why is that so influential? What is it about that? Why? I mean... I don't know, it may have been people's like gateway to literature. Stuff like that, where it's just, oh wow, I, I, the symbolism, I, I get the symbolism now. I, I, oh, I understand 
I, I'm in the old man's head. Wow, books are magical. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's short, and it's not amazingly interesting. It's like the other, uh, who was it that wrote the, the Pearl? Steinbeck, honestly. Is Steinbeck? It's another one of those ones that we had to read in high school. It was like, why? Why? I don't know. I guess that's one of those things that I've, I, I think I may have talked your ear off about it once because I was complaining about my son having to read Scarlet Letter. Scarlet Letter and just why do they pick such difficult books to give to high schoolers to learn with? Why, why do they think that's a good idea? All they usually tend to do is scare kids away from reading. They teach them that reading is a really difficult chore and the only way you can understand a book is by having a textbook that accompanies the book by your side okay so number 15 arthur miller uh death of salesman no i don't know if i know other 1953 the crucible oh the crucible that's arthur miller okay what was it that ian would always quote from (laughs) Yeah, something about... You talk about Tatuba. Tatuba, yeah, that was his favorite character name. Yeah. It would amuse me when he would talk about Tatuba. I've never read The Crucible. I would like to, though. I... Yeah, we had to read it in uh, in school. That's why Ian would talk about Tatuba. It was not bad. I mean, it came out in the 50s, and it was basically protesting McCarthyism. But because it was set in colonial times or whatever, they could get away with it, right? Right. And I like that. Uh, that's clever. In the same way that, you know, if you wrote something criticizing a certain administration, if you said it on another world, if you said it 200 years ago, I think more a more wide audience would embrace it. Okay, so number 14, <laughs> Arthur Miller again. Death of a Salesman? Death of a Salesman. Hey. 1949. Yeah, I, I think I read that one in a class as well. I don't... I think, yeah, I read it in college. Yeah, I think it may have been in college. I don't remember what the class was. You know, I can... I kind of relate to that play. Just, I don't... At least I think I do. I don't know. I may talk about it and people be like, Dude, that wasn't what it was about. You're an idiot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just the desperation of our lead character as he tries to make a living as a salesman, basically be, do what he's expected to do as a man and put food on the table. And he's just it's not happening. He's not doing it. And his life sucks. And he's just always desperate. And, you know, and at the time, I was probably... Uh, too young to really get it, you know, now that I've had to deal with that kind of stuff for 20 years, it would probably resonate all the more for me. Okay, number 13, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. That's uh, All the President's Men, right? All the President's Men, 1974. See, I always confuse All the President's Men and All the King's Men, Mm. because those are the both books that shaped American culture. That one about Nixon. In two miles, Jake Jackson, 149 West toward Hanksville. Did she just say Hanksville? Yes. What the hell? You know, I can see why that's a huge deal for a certain generation. Yeah. That book. I mean, that certainly shaped America. The Yeah. I mean, what they did shaped America. The, the retelling of it maybe is I mean, in the same way as Profiles in Courage may have helped people connect with Kennedy or understand, you know, who he the man was. Yeah, all the president's men. It's like, okay, this is how this happened to our country. This is... Because that was a hugely significant event in American history. Yeah. All right, we got, I think, the most modern book on here. Tim O'Brien. The Things They Carried, 1990. Huh. Are you familiar with that 
one? Cause I, I think that's a, a a soldier one, a World War Two one. Yeah. You know, kind of like Band of Brothers. Only, uh, yeah, maybe I don't know. I'm just I'm seeing the cover of the book in my head, and maybe I'm imagining something else. If you're familiar with that book, let us know. Number eleven, Sylvia Plath. I don't know, but that name sounds familiar. It's called The Bell Jar, 1963. Oh, that book doesn't sound familiar. (laughs) Okay, number 10, John Steinbeck. No, we already did Grapes. Grapes of Wrath isn't on here. Grapes of Wrath was on the real list, yes. Uh, And it's not The Pearl. No. (laughs) Uh, What is it? It's East of Eden. Oh, okay. 1952. Now, I only know that because uh, James Dean was in the film adaptation of East of Eden. Yeah, I'm not, I've James never Dean seen it. James Dean is one of those fascinating people that was famous for a tiny, tiny period of time. But... Yet, and yet is still amazingly iconic all these years later. Yeah, his key was he died. And so therefore it became some kind of a big tragedy and people will remember him forever. I've seen so many of those things where like James Dean sitting on a motorcycle with Marilyn Monroe is sitting right behind him. It's like, we're the iconic people from the 50s who died. It's like Kurt Cobain, you know? Yeah, His I saw star did not you know, shoot for very long before he burned out. I saw a Kurt Cobain tribute magazine yeah, on the too. shelves at Walgreens yesterday. And I, was and I looked at it and I was why like, now? Wow. Yeah, exactly. Is this- it an anniversary or something? Well, be it, but... 25 years or something like that? Right. No, you know, I'd say it was 25 years since Nevermind came out. Yeah, it could be that. I was going to say it's not 25 years since he died. Anyhow. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. So, uh, oddly enough, number nine is also John Steinbeck. A more famous book than East of Eden. Uh, Just lay it on me. I don't know. Uh, you, you know this one. Of Mice and Men, uh, okay. 1937. <laughs> I do know it, but yeah. Only the titles of these, out, these classic novels doesn't always work well for me. It was what year? 37. Huh. Yeah, I remember in Stephen King's book, what is it, 11, 22, 63? Sure. Is that what the numbers were? Where they save President Kennedy from being assassinated. He's a teacher in a school in Texas for several years because his tunnel into the past only goes to one spot, and it's like five years before. It's not, yeah, 1958. Uh, Dora Yeah, President Kennedy comes along and, and is assassinated, and so he has to live for five years waiting for that to happen. So yeah, he becomes a teacher at a school, and yeah, they put on, that's a play they do, is Of Mice and Men. I've never even seen the uh, the movie of it, I, I, There's a couple different adaptations. Yeah. The most recent one was Gary Sinise and John Malkovich. Yeah, I remember the John Malkovich. All right, uh, number eight, Alice Walker. I don't know, what is it? The Color Purple, ah, 1982. Okay. Alice Walker is the author of The Color Purple. That came out in 82? Yeah. How, it was only like three or four years later that it was a movie, right? I'd say the movie was 86, yeah. Interesting. I, I guess I spoke to a lot of people. I've, I've never read it. In fact, it wasn't until really recently that I saw the movie. Yeah, I still haven't seen the movie. I was a kid at the time it came out. It didn't really appeal to me. I love to have been like, oh, historical movie about slavery? Oh, or what about Back to the Future? We could go to that one. <laughs> there you go. Number seven is Ayn Rand Anthem, 1938. A book called Anthem. Huh. Have you heard of Anthem? No. Ian, okay. The only one of hers I know is Atlas Shrugged, I think. Yeah, and that's on the real list, right? Yep. Sorry, I keep saying the real list. You know what I mean? I'm just warning you. I should have warned people from the start. This is our worst episode ever. But uh, <laughs> since we're in the home stretch, I gotta keep going. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes, though, because I won't bury the lead. People can find out ahead of time. So, number six. Oh, you'll know this one Alex Haley. Alex Haley? Yes. 
I don't know the author's name. If I will know the book, then I... Well, you'll know the book. I would think along the lines of the color purple, though, but way bigger deal. Like, such a big deal, oh. I can't believe it's not number one or number two. I can't two. believe it's not butter. Um, uh, is it uh, Uncle Zong's Cabin, then? No, Harriet Beecher oh. Stowe was on the real list. This yeah, is... that sounds like... Oh, well, yeah, something, something along those lines. I don't know, you have to give it to me, man. Roots. Oh, okay. 1976. And yeah, the miniseries would have been, what, 78? Right, right after that. It's interesting. And yeah. the miniseries is probably more famous than the book. Exactly, yeah. A lot of these, when they say, oh yeah, books that changed culture, I guess you could say these books were influential because they were the actual source of the story that made such a you know big difference in culture. But... The Roots miniseries is what really shaped American culture. And I guess, you know, The Shining, we didn't say that that was a thing that made a big difference, but The Shining, uh, you know, movie is what mattered, not the book. Well, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Right, there we go. Way. There's another one where... Uh, and like I said, East of Eden. Yeah, probably the movie in that case, too, although, you know, it's hard to say for sure when we go that far back because we're just not old enough to talk about it. And certainly for you, Last of the Mohicans is the movie. Right. Okay. Although a 200-year-old book, if it's still around, then I would say it's influential. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so this next one, I, I'm at a loss, dude. Willa Cather, My Antonia, 1918. My Antonia, I've heard of it. It's Antonia? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. I've heard of it, but I don't know uh, anything about it, really. I've heard the title is all. I wouldn't have been able to tell you who wrote it. Which shouldn't surprise you since I can barely say who wrote much more influential books than that. Oh, no, that's okay. I just, yeah, I that doesn't, I didn't even know how to say the name of the book, so there's that. Okay, so this next one, Joseph Smith, translator, it says. Ah. So that's the Book of Mormon, uh, 1830. Okay. I can see that being influential in yeah. shaping America there. Let's see. Um, to that. But why is uh, people. why is Dianetics by L. Ron Hubbard not on here? Or is that on the uh, the other list? Yeah, it's on the more important list. Okay, so <laughs> I, I, the non fan voted list. I just find that interesting. I, I, I bet you know it, it inspired the famous musical. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so number three. That was a big cultural influence. Or didn't. Number three, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Little House on the Prairie. I mean, this says Little House in the Big Woods, okay. but that's probably because Little House on the Prairie was the series. Yeah, I like the, the name of the whole series. This was the book. 1932. I have nothing to say about that. It was a big deal, the television series. Yeah, but. Michael Landon has a career because of it. Or maybe he was already something. Well, he was a teenage werewolf. Maybe female listeners... Really, that's a touchstone to them. Yeah, I think my wife digs on the Little House in the Prairie books. She actually got a little box set of paperbacks of all of the series to try and convince our kids to read them because she'd read them when she was a kid. Oh, that's cool. I don't know that our kids ever read them. She also, because she's Canadian, really wanted the kids to read uh, Anne of Green Gables. And I think she was a little more successful with that one. Probably... Not getting them to read it, but getting them to watch the PBS uh, movies that they made of those. Sure. Anne of Avonlea. Was Jack London not American? Was he Canadian? Uh, I don't know. I mean, his name's London, so he's probably British. <laughs> All right, so that brings us to the last two. So number two is Kurt Vonnegut. I'm trying to think. Slaughterhouse Five. Excellent. Was yes, that him? it is. Slaughterhouse Five, nineteen sixty nine. Uh, any thoughts or feelings on that? Number two have, on the. Yeah, list. I've not read it, so I can't really give any thoughts or feelings. I feel like I should have, but I haven't, so I can't. Well, and that brings us to the number one. Also, Ayn Rand. Did you think of anything she wrote other than? Atlas Shrugged? Uh, there's something like the something. The... 
I can't remember what. The Fountainhead, 1943. Okay. Uh, why, why do you think Ayn Rand is so influential? Is so belo- Is If you're on this list, are you beloved? You know? I would assume so. Because in the same way as the Book of Mormon or as Dianetics, there almost seems to be a religious fervor built up around Rand's writing. Right? Yeah. Like a, 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 not a cult following, but a... Yeah, she was really influential in certain, I would say, politics more than like a religion kind of a thing. But, you know, a, a sort of like an anti-communist or, or something like that, where, you know, it's all about survival of the fittest and do what you can to get ahead and, you know, step on the little guy if you have to or whatever kind of a thing, which sort of feels like... Maybe what America is built on a little bit, I guess, when you really think about it. I, I'm, I'm really not very familiar with Ayn Rand, but I have listened to podcasts of people who were fans of her, but I never listened to those episodes to find out what the hell. So I, I guess I can't really say anything about it. <sighs> okay, well, we've reached this, the end of this list. Sorry? <laughs> I remember yeah. there being a list four or five years ago that we talked about that was like the science fiction books. Uh-huh. A hundred science fiction books you must read before you die or some crap like that. And we went through the list in this way. I was like, okay, what's on the list? And I, yep, number 73. Oh, yep, number three. Oh, not on there. Do you remember that? And Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson came up as, like, number two after The Lord of the Rings. But yeah, I remember being pretty surprised by that, too. But when I read Especially that... Especially considering Way of Kings is, what, like two books so far? Uh, still only two books. It's so was... Oh, but How could it be that long big? enough for six books. True. Definitely true. I wonder if those... I've never seen the books themselves, so I don't know if I've read a thousand-page book. Yeah, yeah. Oh, By yeah. listening to that one. Way of Kings was 1,300. We looked yeah. at it just the other day. Well, anyhow, that brings us to the end of our worst episode ever. It's all uphill from here, folks. Yeah. It's going to be lovely. All right. Well, I guess I've been Big Inkovich. And I've been very sorry. And we will uh, see you next time with hopefully something better. Goodbye. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License Which between you and me means nothing Yeah <laughs> I press the button You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine <laughs>